rousing introduction. And welcome everybody, welcome everybody on Ace AM Gather and everybody here and everybody live streaming and everybody that's going to be joining later when catching it up on catching up on YouTube. Welcome. Um, so uh, I'm really happy to be here. I always love coming here and talking and sharing my experience with the with a Course in Miracles. And it, you know, um, the title for my talk today is Stop the Chaos and Glimpses of Heaven. And so it's very interesting to me, like as a student of A Course in Miracles, um, sometimes I get, there's a particular section that I get stuck on. And I don't mean stuck in terms of like, like where I can't understand it and it frustrates me, but I just look at it and I think, gosh, you know, I've seen this before, and I remember reading this section before, titled the, the reading that um, Reverend Vincent did so well, um, The Laws of Chaos. And I remember reading it before and thinking, God, this is a really complicated section, and it, it's really hard. And then I was listening to it being read, you know, I listen to it in my car sometimes, I have recordings that are done, and, um, and I was like, Actually, it's pretty explicit. The laws are pretty explicit. It says right in there, and the first law, and the second law of chaos. And I just thought, oh, this is really interesting. I thought, hey, this is kind of the secret to salvation in a certain way, because I think what A Course in Miracles does is, I do think it teaches the same lesson over and over again, but it does it in different ways to engage us. At least that's me. I, get, I constantly get kind of like intellectually and emotionally stimulated by saying, oh, I haven't read that before. I haven't read it in that way. And so it kind of gives me like, um, it, it keeps me interested. And I, I think that's part of the, the, the brilliance of A Course in Miracles. So anyway, first of all, what is, what is chaos? Chaos is defined as complete disorder and confusion. Now, if this is the law of the ego, then what that means is that most of the time, the world and many, many of us may be in this state or appear to be in this state because if, if we're following the teachings or the, the guidance of the ego. Um, now, what are these laws? And I have visual aids today. So, the first law of chaos is the truth is different for everyone. Okay? The truth is different for everyone. And I thought we should have visual aids say, you know, some of you know I'm a teacher, and what do they say about teaching is that multi-sensory multi um, or, or presentation of information helps you learn. So anyway, with these basic things, right? So there's a little bit of a visual, and if you need that, just let me know and I'll put it back up. That's <laughs> good. <laughs> okay. Um, okay, now. This is really, so this is really interesting to me, this first one. And I think, you know, I've kind of talked about this in the past before. Um, the, the truth is different for everyone. And what that means is where we get in trouble with this law of chaos is when we make them real. Is when we invest in them saying, oh, my truth is the right truth and your truth or your experience is the wrong experience. In other words, when we become judgmental. Now, of course, you know, as you know, um, I always have to go back and uh, I first kind of came across this idea when I was studying the Greeks. I like Greek philosophy, so I have a little. So there's there's a story in one of um, Plato. Plato wrote down Socrates' teachings. Socrates was one of the first great philosophers, and um, and in this, Socrates then taught not quite this. You know, the Course of Miracles teaches the ultimate, right? The Course of Miracles says there's one reality. We're all part of that reality. It's love. We're one being. That's it. You know, plain and simple, right? Um, but so at the time, Socrates also was confronted by member people in Greece and in Athens known as the Sophists, okay? And what the Sophists said was, no, that truth, that truth is particular to everyone, that everyone has their own truth. Now, Socrates was talking about, he believed that there was a truth behind the form. And what, what they referred to them were these ideas, these beliefs, he said, that could be transcend form, just like, just like the Course of Miracles says, that you know, behind form, what are you really looking at is content. And what the Sophists said, um, or what the Sophists were, is kind of like the first politicians. 
okay? And politicians maybe a little bit in the negative self. Not mm -hmm. statesmen. I didn't say statesmen. I said mm -hmm. politicians. Mm -hmm. So they had these clever arguments, really brilliant sometimes mm -hmm. arguments, that was disguising their true intent. Mm -hmm. They were kind of like modern day con men, perhaps. Okay, and that's when they argued that, so they could argue the truth was relative to everyone because they wanted to get things, right? They wanted to justify their wars or they wanted to justify their policies. And so they would argue this. And Socrates was brave and stood up to them. Uh, but of course, we know that Socrates eventually, they put him to death for, for one of those reasons, okay? So the first rule then is, is this thing where when we judge people's differences for, for being wrong, now, if you think about it, just think about all the different, um, all the different ways we can associate differences with people. And I made a list, okay? Sexuality, that's how we can perceive people. Now, people do have different views on sexuality, different expressions of sexuality, all these things. Gender, economic philosophy, some people are communists, some people are total free market, market people, some people are, are like in, in, in the middle. Class, you know, we have the poor class and the rich class and the middle class and the working class, education level, employment, spiritual, right? Oh, that person's really spiritual, but I'm not spiritual because I don't pray six hours a day, right? I'm not a monk. Uh, religious, right? You know, my religion is the true religion, right? I'm Muslim, my religion is the true religion. I'm Christian, that's the true religion. Muslim is wrong. We know what that led to, like over the years, crusades, even in our modern era, we see fundamentalists of, of all stripes. Um, you know, uh, you know, sexual preferences, uh, I'm a top, I'm a bottom, I'm versatile. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we look at all these things and we say, and we say, well, I'm this and the other person's not that. And the problem is when we start judging it, right? When we start saying, oh, well, if, if you're this or that, then you, know, you, must, be, you must have these differences, okay? Um, now, what the Course says, which is interesting, is this. If we realize that we were all the same and that our differences were equally untrue, when brought to the truth of each other, the differences would merely disappear. So when we bring these differences to, um, to Jesus, to Holy Spirit, and look at them, they disappear. Now this leads us to the second law of chaos. And the second law of chaos says, each one must sin and therefore deserves attack and death. Okay? Each one must sin and each one deserves attack and death. All right. Okay, so can we just say that these laws are pretty depressing, okay? All right, they're pretty, de I, you know, they're, they're pretty depressing. But y if you think about it, um, I, the only reason I bring them up is because, you know, like what the Course says is we have to bring these things to light. Because if not, they're operating, it's like our operating system. It's our faulty operating system. It's our virus. If we don't bring them to light, we don't know that they're operating on us, okay? And so... <clears throat> These are things that are constantly going. Now think about this. Let's be, let's be honest with ourselves. Um, what's very interesting about this all is that the Course says that, um, you know, if it's not love, then it's murder. If a thought we have, an interaction we have with whatever situation, person going in our life is attack, then where is it coming from? It's coming from the ego. All right? And this is what this is referring to. What we believe about, what the ego tells us is in our mind is that, oh, everyone else is guilty. And if everyone is, else is guilty, then you deserve what? Punishment. You deserve attack. So, again, taking a look at this, you know, when we do this, sometimes it appears that we're doing it with, you know, good intent, but oftentimes it's not that way. So when we, any time that we have a judgmental thought about another brother or sister, fellow being, a circumstance or situation, um, you know, we're attacking, we're murdering, right? And that's only reinforcing then the belief in guilt in ourselves. Now, as Course of Miracles students, we're like, oh, you know, that's not cool. And so what do we do? Like the, like the, the world says, um, the ego sets up a hierarchy of illusions. So, you know, the world thinks, the world says that, hey, like if you commit murder, that's really bad, right? You commit actual murder, that's a bad thing, and we think that's really bad. 
But what does the what does the Course say? Right? The first principle of the Course of Miracles is that there there's really no difference between one miracle or the other. That what's needed is the correction. So whether I'm you know, now I'm not suggesting we go out and go into work tomorrow and murder someone and see what's different. If I murder someone or if I call them a you know, if I judge them for being you know, not a good worker, or judge them, gossip about them, or something like that. But what the Course is saying, okay, is that there is this, um, that, 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 it's, that it's kind of on the, on the level of mind, our true level, it's all the same. And that we need, to, we need to be aware of all of it. So if we think that, you know, we're being better than another person, because we're not actually, maybe we're not physically murdering someone, but if we're plotting behind their back, or if we're talking behind that about them, or if we're putting them down or judging them, then, you know, in, in essence, what we're doing to our own mind is just as harmful. And that's why, even though the ego puts this hierarchy, the Course says, anything that takes you from your peace, anything that takes you away from love, it's all the same. And so we just have to kind of, we've got to work on that. Okay. Second law, or excuse me, the third law. The third law. Fear of God and each other becomes inevitable. Okay? Fear of God and each other becomes inevitable. Now, when we think about this, <clears throat> you know, if you, some of you, I don't know where your, like, where your belief in God, you know, maybe, maybe, maybe you didn't have a belief in God. I was raised Catholic. And there was very much this presentation of God that was put forth in the Old Testament, sometimes in the New Testament, that, that God, you know, um, rewarded good behavior and you know, it was kind and loving and, you know, compassionate. But if you were, if you exhibited bad behavior, you know, God might destroy you. Sodom and Gomorrah, right? The, in Gomorrah, the sin was, there was some sin, it's argued about history, but uh, one time, one interpretation was the sin was homosexuality, but in reality it was, um, the sin was really inhospitable. They were inhospitable to guess. And so when they, um, when they left uh, Gomorrah, God destroyed it, turned everything to our, turned to sand, okay? So this was the venge, so we're raised kind of this, with this vengeful God. And the, what the Course is telling us, we even, a lot of us then, essentially have this belief that um, in, in our minds that God is out to get us, that God hates us. We believe that in a way that we kind of if we believe this about one another, then we have to project that belief onto God. So, that, that, think about that then. Think about your life and your life situation. If you believe everyone is guilty, then you're attacking everyone. And then, if you also believe that belief it gets extended to God and you're taught that, um, then where's your refuge? Where do you go, right? There's no way to turn to God. Now, of course, Many of us are fortunate, and many of us have had other interpretations of God or interpretations of spirit or love or some idea of spirituality that goes beyond that. But we can't deny that somewhere in our minds, you know, since we all have egos, that this, this belief exists. So what, why is it that people get depressed? Or why is it that people get anxious? Because sometimes, on some level, they don't believe there's anywhere to go. Right? They don't believe that we can go to this resource in our minds and forgive. You know? Instead, what it is, we're afraid. We think that God is going to get us. You know? So what does this mean? It means we bring it to light. Right? And we look at it, and we look at the Course of Miracles, which we manifest it too, and we just say, oh, you know, this, this can't really be. You know, that, um, that this... Um, this belief in God is not really, really true. Okay? So, okay, law number four. You have what you have taken. Okay? You have what you have taken. So, um, this one this one applies, I, the, the way I can look at this one is mostly like, look at the politics of the world. Okay? What do nations do? This is how I basically see it. Nations go out and say, hey, like, I have, well, you know, we have resources, and you know, if you're a rich nation, you have a lot of resources, whether they be material resources or whether they be, um, uh, you know, education resources, technological resources, and other countries look at that and they say, well, why don't you share it with us? 
And if you believe, going back to the second law, you believe everyone's guilty, right, and sinful, no, I'm not giving it to you, I'm not sharing with you, you're going to use that against me. And so what happens is we end up having all these conflicts over things that other countries want. So, yeah, all these wars look like they're about land, or they're about religion, protecting my religious shrine, or they're about oil. But really what they're deeply, deeply down that they're about is the sense of lack, that you have what I want. Okay? And then think about, you know, think about, go back to like, um, you know, think about a bad relationship that you had. You know, a bad relationship. And um, I, I think of it like this, like, what is it that, you know, I wanted from that relationship and that I didn't get? And how did that cause problems? And that's how all these kind of law, I think the, the way, like when we're talking about these different laws, this is, this is what I think is interesting about them. Like, the, they're in there for us to look at, right? They're in this and say, hey, how does this apply to my life? How is attacking other people working for me? How is trying to get something from another person working for me? How's it working for our country, you know? How is it working for um, other countries? You know, how does this, how does this, this sense of self-interest? When I was a student in college, I learned in pop political science that one of the theories of political science is this, is that nations pursue their own self-interest. That's all they do. That's a huge thing in foreign policy. They pursue their self-interest. There is nothing about shared interest. The only time we get to shared interest is when we get, what, World War II. Right? After World War II, when we nearly obliterated half the, well, not half the population, but, you know, over 100 million people who died in World War II. And then someone said, hey, maybe we should have the United Nations. You know, maybe there's another way of doing things. Isn't it like us, like when we're doing something and it's causing havoc in our life, what, you know, the pain causes us, right? And so that's how we get to these places. But these laws, unless they're kind of, you know, and you hear statesmen, as I said, you hear statesmen talk about this. Right? And they say we have to look beyond our own self interest. We have to look beyond around humanity. And you know, for some people that's what you know, that's what they they look at. Okay. Now I have this Okay, the last law. There is no substitute for the love. Or I put in parentheses for God. There is no or there is. Uh, there is oh I'm sorry, there is a substitute for love. Okay. Okay, thank you. There okay. is a substitute for love. <laughs> And that means there's a substitute for God. And so, you know, we know this from special relationships. It's kind of a, it's a direct correlation to special relationships. So what do we oftentimes do? We're in, like, we see, gosh, this world's so crazy, you know, everyone's out to get me, God's out to get me, you know, I'm trying to get what I can, you know, you, you hear that expression, take what you can get in the world, you know, you hear that oftentimes in commercials, you're entitled to this. And so where's the saving grace? Well, the saving grace is specialness, having special relationships, having special love relationships. And so that's supposed to be like kind of our, that's like our, that's our castle. That's our protective area. But of course, even then, that becomes a problem after a while because eventually, even with your special love partner or partners or, you know, work at work or wherever you have these special relationships, they also eventually don't work. You know, someone stops giving what you want. Someone does something you don't like. Okay, so we, you know we're kind of in, um, we're kind of in a in, in, in kind of a thing. So the question then is, as course students, what do we do? Well, I think this. The course says this. How can you know whether you choose the stairs of heaven or the way to hell? And it says, how do you feel? How are you feeling right now? <laughs> is peace in your awareness? So I had this, uh, this kind of experience um, last Sunday. I was leaving uh, our apartment, coming to service, and like I just walked out and like, um, you know, I, I had dressed for church and it was sunny and I crossed the street and, and I got the, I smelled the ocean. You know, sometimes you can, I don't know if you know this, but you can smell the ocean even near Dolores Park. You can smell the ocean. And I was like, you know what, everything in this moment is perfect. You know, I just was going to church, looking forward to going to church. I hadn't been in a while. Um, looking forward to seeing everyone. The weather was perfect, you know. And, and, and that's what I mean by the glimpse, glimpses of heaven, which I had talked about. Is that the more I think that we're willing to go and, and, and like take these laws of chaos and say, hey, 
you know, if I'm having trouble in a relationship or a situation, you know, does one of these apply? You know, does something in here apply? Am I judging another person? You know, um, am I making, am I needing to be right mm -hmm. or happy, right? So again, and, and so it comes out, it doesn't, and again, it doesn't mean that we're, it doesn't mean that we may, we may be right. We might be in our right mind and another person might be in their wrong mind. So we still pursue Holy Spirit's guidance in terms of how we behave and how we respond. But we don't, it's like that Al-Anon principle, loving detachment. We, we don't judge the other. We try to get to the point where we're not judging them, condemning them for, the, for what we perceive as the harm that comes, that comes to us. So we have to do that. And what the Course says is, one of the quotes from the Course is, <clears throat> Are you sure the goal of heaven can be reached? So if you're pursuing a course in your life, a course of action in your life, and you put as your goal heaven, you put as your goal peace, and you follow that path, you ask for the miracle, then that's what you get. You get heaven. The Course says this, When the temptation to attack rises to make your mind darkened, and murderous. Remember you can see the battle from above. When they occur to you, leave not your place on high. Quickly, choose the miracle instead of murder. And God himself will gently lean to you and hold you up. So when we're tempted by the chaos of the ego, Remember to be above the battlefield, to choose God, to choose love, to forgive, and you will be held up by love itself. And that's my talk for today. Yay.